I tell you what, I had to find a coat and tie this morning. <laughs> I hadn't had one in a long time, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I'm so glad to be here. If I don't go ahead and take care of this part of the business, um, I'll be in trouble. But I officially bring you greetings from one of the criminals who used to live in this territory. And his name is Lamar Dinkins. <laughs> Bless his heart, I talk to him at least four or five times a week. He's in jail now. So if you want to talk to him, he's either on the phone or you stand in the winter looking in at him and hearing Joyce. But by the way, Joyce is doing so much better right now. So we're grateful for that. And I have another one of my buddies back here. I, I lost him in a minute. Just where are you? Where are you? Yeah, yeah, back of justice, you know. He's another one. Yeah, right over there. There he is. Yeah, we've nailed a lot of nails together, told a lot of stories, and somewhere along the way, we shared our hearts with each other. And for that, I am deeply, deeply grateful. If my dad were here this morning, he would be very critical of my sermon because he always told me, Don, just take a verse and, 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 and expound on it. But this morning, I'm going to do a whole lot more than that. Hope not as long as you might think. But uh, I'm going to do that. You know, I, I have this real hunger in my heart to help Christian people, including my own self, grow in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to help people walk in that faith. You know, if you look at what Jesus did on the face of this earth, rest assured that one of the things he did more than any other thing, he wanted to place himself in your heart and in my heart and people like us so that we could be like him. And that's the purpose of this sermon this morning. How can we be more like Jesus? Uh, and my sermon this morning will come from um, uh, Matthew. Uh, and, and so I'm going to read it for you right now, even though I'll refer to it as we move on into the sermon. It's, it has to do when, when Jesus was walking on the water. In Matthew 14, beginning with 25, Jesus, you know, I just as well to do something right now, you know, because if I don't, I'm going to mess up right off the bat. So let me put these $8 glasses on. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went on up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was ready, already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went up out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. What is you? Peter replied, Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus simply said, Come, come. And when you, Peter got up, I got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. They then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God.
You know, the, the problem that Jesus was having as he came into this world to share with us the very heartbeat, the very lifestyle, the very purpose of, of, of God in our lives was that there was a mindset that upset so many people because Jesus was so unlike them, but yet he wanted them to be like him. You know, he stonied off and, and, and I'm going on to a point and I'm going to dwell on these experiences over and over again. And this is where my dad would just get upset with me. He said, just give me a verse, Don, and talk about that. I said, okay, dad, by the way, I loved him because he adopted me and gave me a name. Now, <clears throat> the, Jesus, I think he used the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, over and over and over and over again. Because that sermon tells us about the heartbeat and the nature and the character of God. In the very beginning, there's these 10 or 12 verses, and we put a label to that. We call them the what? B attitudes. The B attitudes. The kind of attitudes that's expressed in the heart of God and magnified to us through the life of Jesus Christ while he is on this earth. And I think Jesus preached that sermon time and time again. But he went on to tell us some other things about life that was so different from the society in which he lived in at that time as a physical human being. He talked about murder. And he extended a new interpretation of murder. Sure, it was when somebody shoots somebody or stabs somebody. But, but we could be murderers in our attitudes. He talked about adultery. He talked about divorce. He talked about swearing. He talked about vengeance. And vengeance was such a big part of their lives. It was an eye for an eye. They have so different from the lifestyle of the one who says, look at me, my life exemplifies, it mirrors the very heart and the nature of God himself. But you know, one that just really upset the people the most, he said, you're to love your enemy, to pray for your enemy. You know, from time to time as a minister in a church, there was sometimes I had a hard time loving somebody. You know, I'm sorry. I just had a hard time. You know, I really did. I remember one guy, I pre, and that's when I was in Dothan, and I, I, all the heart surgeries was in Birmingham. That was a long trip. I preached that man's sermon many times back and forth. And he was just an unlovable fellow. And I could tell you another story about that, but I won't, but I will say this. I learned through that man how to forgive because in his life, I was allowing him to learn my life because of that vengeance, that, that un-Christ-like attitude. Because even Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. I like the way he defined prayer. You know, we call it the Lord's Prayer. But it's, it's the people's prayer. Because he was telling me how to pray. He told the people to stop worrying and, and judging others. The nature, the character of heart. The song this morning, Linnell, got it, uh, was, was, you know, it was seeking the strength and the comfort and the love of God in the time of need. You know, stop worrying. Stop judging others. You know, I noticed when the, when the crowd was talking uh, uh, to Jesus, listening to Jesus, and when he got through with this sermon, when Jesus had finished preaching and saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. They saw the difference. But yet their perception of Jesus 
and what they wanted in a Messiah was totally different from what he wanted to be. You know, even when Jesus was teaching through parables, he was magnifying this sermon on the mountain. Another thing that Jesus did was so different. Jesus never eliminated people from his ministry. Just stop and think for a moment. In the eighth chapter of, of, of Matthew, I think it's a beautiful story. And I want just, just one word or two out of it. You know, it, it, when, when uh, this, this uh, leopard came to Jesus, See, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, there were some problems there because society had eliminated this man from their presence, probably because of health reasons. But it's kind of like Lamar, you know, you got to talk to him, you got to talk to him through a window or on the telephone. This man couldn't even eat with his family. They had to put food out in somewhere in, a, in an area and when, and, and eat where he could find some food. And, and he always, when he saw people coming, he had to holler, unclean, unclean. Don't come near me. But he comes near Jesus because he saw something in Jesus that was so different. That difference was that Jesus was, was uh, he didn't eliminate anybody. No one. And it's also in the eighth chapter, the Roman commander, army officer, his, his servant was paralyzed. And he came to Jesus and he says, you don't have to come to my words. You don't have to come to my home. You just say those words and I believe you. He was a man who was, a, was an enemy of the Jewish people. And he says, I, I see in you, Jesus, enough to know that all you've got to do is just speak. Jesus did not eliminate him. Well, in Matthew 8, there were two men. They were living in caves. And those caves were normally used for, what, graves. And they were so mentally ill, I think, that they, that they were fearful, people were fearful of them. And they, was, they would frighten people as they came along the road. And then when the community got together to, to create a, 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 a large posse to, to put chains around these two guys, they were so wrong that, uh, strong they could break those chains. But you know what? I'm gonna just drop this on the floor. These two men were isolated from people, but Jesus healed them because he loved them. Mark 5, 21 says, even that he ministered to women like no other person had ever done. Wow. Because you see, women were isolated. Remember the woman at the well? She came there at noon, why? Because her community had isolated her. Even though she was in big kind of sin, Jesus did not isolate her. He made a lady out of this woman. But here we are now at our, at getting ready for our scripture lesson. It would seem that this was done in the other Gospels just prior to the feeding of the 5,000. And here was this crowd of people that came to hear Jesus. In the last verses of, of 14, of, 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 yeah, 14. And, and so... Jesus says, it's time to feed them. And the disciples said, no, send them home. 
And Jesus says, no, I said, let's feed them. And the disciple says, look, we don't even have the money to buy enough food for us, much less 5,000. Jesus says, let's feed them. And he turned the food of a little kid and enough food to feed over 5,000 and had enough left for doggy bags for the rest of the week for the disciples, if you'll let me say it that way. But we say today, we can't do that. I absolutely cannot. We, this church can't feed 5,000. I'm going to tell you one thing about this church that I know. I've been a witness in this church right here when you fed over 5,000 people. I remember so well one of the storms that came raging up through here. The first thing that I did as a direct mission soon after I came here. So I got a telephone, no cell phones, CB was the way we communicated. I didn't even know about a rescue service for disaster relief. It happened. And I found this church involved, deeply involved in the community here. And then there was another storm that happened. I was the director of missions then, and I said a lot of my work that I was doing because I knew a lot of people. I dealt with them for years. I would bring food in all ears and, and, and other places. And I witnessed here in this church because you all were using people all over the South who sent food, who sent clothing, who sent all kinds of need. And this place was full. You could hardly walk in this place. There was so much here. See, you know about feeding 5,000. You've been part of it. You know, Jesus uh, turns to, the, to the, his disciples and he says, look, I hope you can, in my words, my words, I hope you can see what I'm trying to say to you. If you're going to grow in your likeness of the ministry of my heart, you've got to practice the law of repetition. That's what Jesus was doing throughout all his ministry. All he was doing was repeating the law of repetition. He was telling the same stories, healing not the same people, but was healing people and raising the dead and, and feeding people and ministering to people who had need. Repetition. You know, I was wondering also, why in the world, Pat, didn't these disciples recognize the law of repetition. Because he'd already been at another time asleep in the boat with this unbelievable storm. And now he's there in another storm and they forget what Jesus did the first time. But he's repeating himself. I must say this, your Christian faith will never grow until you learn how to, re to repeat to repeat, to repeat, to repeat. I do a disciple group. And the way we do things, we, we study like this passage and we read it several times during the course of a week. And every time we read it privately, we write down in our journal what we believe God is saying to us. You know, when we got through the New Testament, my guys in my group said, Brother Don, let's do this again. Let's start over in Matthew and let's do it again. Because they felt they needed, they had missed something and they want to hear it all. 
and we started repeating. It's amazing when we went over these lessons again, how each one of these men were beginning to grasp hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was changing their lives, including me. See, when we were saved, Jesus did not load us with, with all the spiritual knowledge and all the spiritual truth. You and I still have to repeat. Pick up the scripture. Study the scripture. Put it in our hearts and our lives. Be part of, of groups like this right here. Let me illustrate it in this way. Back in my young days, I decided that I needed to be a good golfer. So I went to took lessons. And the golfer, what did he do to me? He said, look, Don, he told me how to stand. He told me how to swing the club. Over and over again, he told me. And finally, he says, he corrected me a lot. And he said, now, if you want to be a good golfer, go to the driving range and hit these, the balls over a thousand times. Repeat it over and over again. Guess what Jack State football players and, and Alabama and Auburn football players are doing right now? They're doing the very same thing they did last year. They're repeating good skills and relearning good skills and how to do things. Let me say it like this. None of us are smart enough to grasp it the first time. We hear some of it. There's still some men out there. You know, not only do we, we, we we're practicing we're, and repeating. Now, here's the story. You know, John says, in that uh, it's interesting what John says. He says, when Jesus really got through feeding the people, you know what they said? Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Perception. They wanted a king. I'm telling you, our backgrounds have a way of changing our perception. And one of the best things in our own Christian journey is when we realize it and we can turn loose of that which controls us and, and, and allow the, the very kingdom king, the Lord of lords and the king of kings, speak to our hearts and we can see him through clearer vision. Our eyes are better, clearer to see what he wants us to do. You know, Jesus said, get in the boat to the disciples. He didn't want them to deal with this. Go to the other side, sea of, the side of the Sea of Galilee. All of them were boats. When they knew how to do the boats, they jumped in this big boat and started rowing up to the top part of the lake, the, the historians say, and it was, which was narrow compared to the downside. And, and when they got out just a couple of hours, by the way, they should have been on the other side of the lake, of the river, by, the, the sea by then. But when they got over there, no, couldn't do it. The storm was stopping them. And it had blown them down to the middle part of the lake. You know, the storm was unmerciful. They could not, it wouldn't let itself up. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they looked down and they saw something moving. It was a ghost. It was a ghost. Now, just to be honest with you, I know about ghosts. I can remember as a little bitty kid, but like this one right here. We, we, I lived on the edge of Columbus, Georgia, in the woods across the street from That's where we played. We played in the woods every day. And over, we could see way over yonder, way over yonder, an old abandoned house. And guess what? It was haunted. 
It was haunted. And so the bigger boys in the community, you know, chicken is what we played then sometimes to get out in trouble. They convinced us that we were just chicken because we wouldn't go over there in that house and see what it was all about. Well, after pondering that for a while, we decided we'd try. Well, it took a while, several weeks, to finally get over there. And when we got up on the back porch, the wind blew the door to. Well, I don't know who got home first. <laughs> but, but we were certain there were ghosts. You know, what, what's a ghost? That, that's, that's, what is a ghost? A ghost simply is this. It's a creation of our own minds. The creation of our own minds. You know, and, and I saw in the church when I moved from, from, from Heflin after 19 years, the church was full of ghosts. They had split. 165 to 164. That's a split. Really was. And the first week I, I was there, I said, Lord, what in the world have you put me in? Because everywhere you looked, there was a ghost around the door. It was a memory that they couldn't turn loose. You know, See, we want God to do something for us. Here I am, do it. Or, Lord, please don't give me something to do that, that it stretches me. It, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm going to tell you, we grow best when God gives us something to do in which we stretch, even though we might be uncomfortable, but when we start seeing those ghosts that we create in our own minds, it limits us in our growth like Christ, in Christ. You know, I remember uh, <clears throat> that, that as, as Peter was out there in, 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 in the, in the uh, he saw Jesus. Uh, he, now, let me remind you, th these disciples were right where God wanted, Jesus wanted them. They were right where he wanted them. Because he said, get in the boat and go to the other side. And here they are. In the midst of a sea. But Jesus doesn't condemn Peter when Peter starts sinking. I think what had happened, the waves, I'm not, a, listen, I'm telling you, you don't want to go see, deep sea fishing with me. I've tried it. it I, I, I wait, I lost 10 pounds before I could get back to town. But you know, I could see this wave up high. When we were in Hawaii one time, I could see this on the north side, I saw these huge waves, I mean, huge, 20 feet high. And I could see down in the bottom, down here, I could imagine, where when these folk in those, riding those waves we were down in here, and you couldn't see them. And all of a sudden, out of the sky. I think when Jesus went down because of the wave situation, that's when Peter lost his focus. You know, I have a grandson. I love him to death. He's my buddy. He got an ADD has trouble focusing. I'm teaching him how to drive. And once when I said, Joshua, why are you off the road right here, son? I know you saw those cows. You saw that. He loves a John Deere. He sees a John Deere. He's lost his mind. He's focused. And we, we, we work with that. And here's what I want to say. That, 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 and when we're studying the scriptures for our own good, please don't lose focus. Please don't lose focus. 
I remember a story about my dad. We were in tomato business. You know, he was teaching me how to drive, and it was easy there because our packing house, warehouse, and all was on a dirt road. And we could, uh, the trucks, when we would back up we'd, we, to unload, we would then drive down about 50, 75 feet, turn in a vacant lot, and go around a big oak tree, and come back in. And the dad would let me drive a truck on that little stretch of the road. He talked with me about it and told me how to do it. But one day, the kids beyond that, I could see them out in that vacant lot playing. I had worked hard to drive that truck that day because I'd un helped unload it. And it had a lot of tomatoes on it. And so I sideswiped the parked truck and that truck. Not much, but just barely hit the one part of it. I saw a ghost immediately. It's going to be my dad. He's going to tell me, you will not drive anymore, young man, for the next six weeks because you didn't follow my instructions. My dad jumped up on the running board. He said, Don, tell me, what did you do wrong? And I didn't want to say, he said, no, just tell me. I said, well, I saw those, my boy's friends over there playing and I, I just, I wasn't watching. He said, yeah, I know. Now let's talk about how you're going to get out of this mess. And we talked about it. He got down off of the truck. He looked back up at me and he says, now go park it. You know, I learned a lesson later on as I look back on that. See, my ghost was fear. I figured I'd lost something that I really wanted. But dad turned and says, drive that truck. What he was really saying, don't quit. Don't quit. Look who's going to stop the storms. Think about it, didn't we? Who's going to stop the storms? Who's going to stop the pandemic? It will be. One day, when it's time. Let me just close with this story. It's, I read it. Remember, the, I remember it very well. I had a pastor in, Virginia, pastor in Virginia when this was happening. In the mountains of Virginia. I don't mean the foothills, the mountains. And this guy by the name of Jonas Salk, had discovered a cure for, cat, for polio. Polio was a big thing for me because I used to play my trumpet in the band and we would go to, up to for, uh, West, uh, I don't know where we went to, up to where they, all the, out of Columbus where they had all the, uh, the, the polio patients, Warm Springs. And every year we'd play for their Halloween parties. Here they come in iron lungs and people in the community had dressed those iron lungs up and that looked like big tubes. They were in these big tubes with their heads sticking out. And we would play concerts and everything. You know, uh, and I remember that when I was in Virginia then and we would go up every Sunday afternoon at the high school and take this medication that would eliminate, eliminate polio. And someone said to him one day, and I read, read that he said this, the reporter says, you failed 200 times. How did you feel when you failed 200 times? His comment was, I've never failed. But you, no, I've just learned 200 ways that will not work. You know, you and I try 200 ways, that's our ways, to do things sometimes. Hopefully, we can look back and see. 
that what we are really learning and should be learning is to do it the way Jesus wants it to be done. Guess how many of us he's eliminated? None. None. If you want to be like Jesus, and I think that's what he wants us to be when he came into my heart and to your heart. He wants you and me to be like him. Don't quit on this journey. It's worth the effort to learn how to drive. To drive the way Jesus wants you to drive. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because during those times when it's the darkest are the times when Jesus is the light and will light the way for you and me. God bless you in this time of need.